So let's Okay. Go. All right. Good. Okay. So uh, hello, everyone. We're here live with uh, Dr. Jim Adams, and we really appreciate you taking your time to be here with us today, Dr. Adams. Thanks very much. Okay, so we're gonna do, for those of you who don't know Dr. Adams, we'll give you a quick intro. Uh, so Dr. James Adams leads the Autism Research Program at Arizona State University. Uh, he also is the president of the Autism Society of Greater Phoenix. He's the president of the Autism Nutrition Research Center and is the chair of Science Advisory Board of the Neurological Health Foundation. Somewhere in there, I know that he must find time to sleep, but clearly very busy man. So thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. Uh, Dr. Adams' uh, research and advice on nutrition has been uh, invaluable to parents and clinicians alike. Um, so we, we welcome you here and thank you for taking the time. You're very welcome. Okay, so uh, we're, today we're going to talk about Dr. Adams' uh, research on microbiota transplant therapy. Um, so we know that do, uh, children on the spectrum and, and adults on the spectrum typically have uh, gut issues and some problems, um, well, quite a few problems in the GI area. So we're going to talk about that briefly. Dr. Adams is going to give us a little bit of background on that um, and some of the things that we've seen in common in ASD. And then we're going to go into his clinical research on the topic. So Dr. Adams, I will hand it over to you and uh, give us maybe a little bit of background on um, some of the common uh, bacteria and gut issues that we see in, in autism that led you to do this research. Sure. So um, it's well known and, and been established from many studies that children and adults with autism are more common than the typical people to have chronic GI problems, especially constipation or diarrhea or alternating between the two. Um, and it's estimated, depending on different studies, of order 30 to 50 percent of children and adults with autism have these chronic GI problems that cause them substantial pain and discomfort and really decrease the quality of their life. Also in a study we did, and there have been several studies since then, we found that children and adults with autism who have more severe GI problems also have worse autism symptoms. So there seems to be a correlation there. And it's hoped then that if we can treat and reduce those GI problems, <clears throat> that we hope we may also be able to reduce autism symptoms. Right. Great. Uh, so, so with that being said, uh, so that led you to doing this research. So if you could give us maybe a little bit of, for those that don't know at all, maybe we can backtrack a little bit, don't know what microbiota transplant uh, therapy is. Can you give us sort of a, a description and sort of definition of what that is? Yeah, maybe it helps first just to talk a little bit about the role of the gut bacteria and how important they are. Perfect. So everyone has um, of order a thousand or more species of bacteria in your gut. And most of them are very beneficial. They help with digesting food, they help with producing certain key vitamins like biotin and vitamin K. They also help with regulating your immune system because a lot of your immune system is focused in the gut. It helps with a water balance, water absorption, and it also helps prevent uh, the overgrowth of bad bacteria that could be harmful or even fatal. And so having healthy gut bacteria is very important when a person has a, a bowel movement, about half of, that back, half of that stool is gut bacteria. So it tells you we have a lot of bacteria in our gut and they play a lot of very important roles, as I mentioned. And so there have been quite a few studies now by our group and others showing that people with autism often have abnormal um, gut bacteria. A simple way families can look at this is just look at a child's stool and see if it looks abnormal, smells abnormal, it's an abnormal consistency, unusually hard or very soft or liquid-like. And that's a very good clue that you have abnormal gut bacteria. Um, so there's a lot, been a lot of interest to see if we can uh, normalize gut bacteria. So maybe it helps to explain a little bit about where the whole concept of microbiota transplant came from. Great. Uh, there's a very nasty uh, gut disorder called Clostridium difficile or C. diff. It causes life-threatening diarrhea. It affects about half a million Americans each year, kills about 29,000 Americans a year. So almost as many as die in car crashes. So oh, yeah. very nasty bacteria. 
<clears throat> it can be treated with antibiotics, but after treatment, it often comes back. And when it comes back, again, it can lead to a downward spiral where people just become sicker and sicker until they die. And so it was discovered that one very effective treatment for it is to take some stool, some poop from a healthy person and put it in the sick person. And that will restore their normal gut bacteria. Within two to three days, they're cured of this life-threatening infection. And unlike with antibiotics, it essentially never comes back. So it's a 90% uh, cure rate. <clears throat> so it's just amazing that a little bit of stool from one person, one time, given as a rectal enema, or given as part of a colonoscopy, or believe it or not, with a nasal gastric tube down through the stomach into the intestines, all of those work very well. And it's just miraculous how effective it is. <clears throat> so the FDA now allows microbiota transplant to be used for people with this life-threatening C. diff infection, if it's recurring, if the antibiotics haven't worked. So they allow it, but they haven't approved it yet. No one's done all the phase one, phase two, phase three studies to have it approved as an official drug. So it's a very strange legal position. Right. But um, there's no doubt it's very effective, but the FDA is being cautious because like with blood products, there's some possibility of a risk of transferring an infection. So there was one, there have been two very sad cases, even though tens of thousands of people have used microbiota transplant without any major harm. There were recently two um, cases where people received microbiota transplant from a donor who had multiple drug resistant bacteria. The donor had a normal immune system, so they weren't affected, but the people who received that uh, gut bacteria had very compromised immune systems, very weak immune systems. Mm. So in those people, they both became very sick and one of them became so sick, they eventually died. So this was someone who had just had bone marrow transplant. And so their immune system was totally shut down uh, chemically in order to the body wouldn't reject the bone marrow transplant. Right. And so that was a very unusual case. I so see. we do have to be a little cautious about the donors and about the recipients. Um, but um, aside from those two very rare cases, um, out of tens of thousands of cases, it's generally very safe and very well um, tolerated. So, because so at, at this point, have we only seen this kind of therapy done for patients who have C. diff? So that's what I was just coming to. It's a great question that it is becoming to be used more commonly in research studies for other GI conditions like ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. And it seems to have some benefit there, but much less than for C. diff. So much lower cure rates, probably they're just underdosing. They're not using enough doses. But a collaborator of ours in Australia, Tom Barodi, He's a gastroenterologist who's treated over, his clinics treated over 17,000 people with microbiota transplant very successfully. And he treated nine children with autism. And he found like, unlike C. diff patients where one dose was all it took, autism patients were much harder to treat. He had to treat them every day for three months and slowly, gradually, their GI symptoms improved. And to his surprise, their autism symptoms improve too, according to the parents. So this is very exciting. Yeah, that's very exciting. So based on that, we went ahead and uh, asked the FDA for permission to do a phase one uh, research study of microbiota transplant for children with autism. We worked with a group out of University of Minnesota that um, uh, uses a very rigorous um, donor selection so they reject 90% of donors and only take the top 10% healthiest. Um, and then they screen it and process it very carefully to make a very pure product. So all the waste material is removed and just 99% gut bacteria. So it's like a probiotic that you take in a capsule. And so we use this in a research study for 18 children, ages seven to 16. Uh, these children had all had serious GI problems since infancy. They'd never had a period of normal GI health. They'd all had constipation or diarrhea or alternating between the two their whole life. Mm. And so 
we went into this treatment and we did similar to what we done uh, our colleague had done in Australia. We used two month, two weeks of oral vancomycin, the special antibiotic to kill off harmful bacteria. And then we used a bowel cleanse for one day, just like you'd have for a colonoscopy to really flush out any remaining bacteria or a stool in the gut. And then we gave high dose microbiota and then low dose for eight weeks. And we found good improvements. We found that there wasn't much benefit right away, but slowly, gradually over about five to six weeks, uh, by then we'd had about an 80% reduction in GI problems. Wow. Almost every one of the children, 16 of the 18, had a huge improvement or, or total reduction of gut problems. So it's very exciting. That is amazing. That's truly astounding. Yeah. Considering they'd had these problems for years, yeah. they tried many different treatments and nothing had worked for them. Oh my. But then what was really pleasing to us is to see that there was also an improvement in autism symptoms, but it didn't happen right away. In fact, yeah. With the vancomycin, the first few days, about two thirds of the children got a little worse, a little worse hyperactivity, a little worse uh, hyperactivity and irritability. Hmm. But then after a few days, they got better. So we think what's happening is that the bacteria that are causing that hyperactivity and irritability, as they're killed off, they're releasing all their toxins all at once. So you hmm. get a little bit worse and then they're dead and gone and then you get better. And taken over by the good bacteria that have now been taken over, correct? Right. So a good analogy we like to use is it's like a garden. If you just weed your garden um, and do nothing, then those weeds are going to grow back. But if you weed the garden and then replant with healthy seeds, or in this case, healthy gut bacteria, then you have a healthy garden. And Perfect. I love that analogy. That's, that's that, very clear. That, that works good. I like that. I like that a yeah. lot. Yeah, I think that makes good sense for a lot of people. It, it is a very good analogy. It is, um, it is. You you're, have a lot of gut bacteria, as we say, a thousand species. At the start of our study, kids with autism are missing several hundred of these species. But one child is missing these several hundred, another child is missing these several hundred. So it's a lot of variation from one child to another. I see. So that's why just a standard probiotic of one or a few species probably isn't going to be nearly as much benefit as getting a donation from a healthy donor with a thousand plus species. So now when you have the healthy donor, do you specifically test to see which species of bacteria they, they have, or do you just sort of, you know, clean out the, any bacteria or toxicants and things like that, and just go with what they have, or is it tested to see exactly what strains they have? We still have a lot to learn about what is healthy and again, it's not a question for bacteria in many cases, is it good or bad, but it's a question of how much do you have? Do you have the right balance of bacteria? So we still have a lot to learn, but we go through a very extensive donor screening process, just like the American Red Cross to make sure they have no uh, history of infections or any infectious diseases. We make sure that they're in good physical health, make sure no history of GI problems or even GI cancers in their family. We make sure that they're a good body weight, not underweight, not overweight, because that also is associated with abnormal bacteria. Right, um, right. So we do a lot of extensive testing for pathogenic bacteria to screen for those. Um, but then ultimately what we're giving is a donation of a good balance of a thousand plus species of bacteria from a healthy donor. Uh, but each donor is a bit different. Which you would never get a thousand species in any probiotic on the market, right? That's right. That's yeah. right. So it's a huge advantage. So probiotics in principle make a lot of sense, but in practice, probiotics are generally bacteria that are cultured in milk, in air, whereas the bacteria in your gut are very different. They're anaerobic bacteria. They're killed by oxygen. Mm. And so you have very different composition of bacteria in your gut. So probiotics can help temporarily, and we need more research on those but it's a far cry from giving one or a few strains that grow in milk versus a thousand plus strains that you get from a healthy donor. Sure. And so you mentioned that one of the interesting things that one of the outcomes that happened was that not only did you see improvements during the study and shortly after, but 
you know, long term after the fact, they still continue to see improvements in not only their gut health but also symptoms and behaviors. Um, what what would you attribute that to? Being, you know, what what would allow that those bacteria to colonize versus maybe previously where they didn't have enough bacteria and their, their bacteria weren't colonizing. So what would you say you would give, you know, credit to on that? So it's complicated, but at the start of the study, what we can say is that the children with autism had, were missing several hundred species of bacteria that a low diversity of bacteria. Um, at the end of the study, at the end of treatment, they had a normal level, a normal number of species. So we normalized their gut bacteria by restoring hundreds of species that had been missing. Um, and they can help in many ways, and probably most importantly, keeping uh, away pathogens from regrowing, but also by helping digesting food, by regulating the immune system, by producing neurotransmitters, by producing key vitamins. So they can help in a lot of different ways. And what was really interesting was that by the end of the treatment, we found there was about a 25% reduction in autism symptoms. So some placebo effect, but across the board, we were seeing improvements in language, improvements in social interaction, uh, less stimming and repetitive behaviors, a more general interest in the world around them. It was just remarkable, as well as you know, some of the secondary symptoms of uh, less hyperactivity, less irritability, um, just generally doing better in a lot of different areas. So it was very exciting. So That's we great. stopped then and, and published our paper and we even did a, a short eight week follow up to make sure that the results were stable, that at eight weeks after we stopped treatment, everything was stable. So that was all very promising. But then about a year later, several families came up to me and said, Professor Adams, my son's doing even better these days. <laughs> By the third time I heard that, I said, okay, we have to do a study. Yeah. So we did a follow up, which is very rarely done. In, in research studies. So two years after treatment had stopped, we followed up with every one of the families. Bless their hearts, every single family agreed to be followed up. We had zero dropouts in our study, which wow. is very rare. In that any is rare. Because it was a very well-tolerated treatment and people were seeing very good benefits in almost all cases. And so what the families told us is that two years later, most of the gut benefits had remained there were a few families that had lost benefits. One family had had a strep infection. They took antibiotics. They lost their GI benefits. They went back to where they had been. But most of the families retained most of their GI improvements. What was really interesting was the autism symptoms. They said at the start of the study, there was good improvement at the end of treatment. But then they said over the next couple of years, it was just slow, steady improvement over the next two years it just seemed like the children were now better able to learn better. That without the pain and discomfort of their GI symptoms, they could have better attention, better focus. They could learn language, learn social interactions. We're having less stimming behaviors. So just family after family told us just slow, steady improvement. And our expert evaluator uh, said that at the end of the study, there was about a 47% reduction and autism symptoms. Wow. There's some placebo effect, but a lot of that effect seems to be very real and very exciting. That is really exciting. That that's absolutely amazing. Especially, I mean, the long term effect is what is so interesting. You know, there's not very many uh, protocols or treatments out there that once treatment ends, that you continue to see benefit and progression. Um, so that's very very exciting. Yeah, yeah, it's especially exciting because an earlier study had used vancomycin by itself, that antibiotic, and they found that temporarily there was good benefit and they even treated for eight weeks. When they stopped treating, all the benefits were lost, the GI improvements, the autism improvements. Yeah. So that's why we were so pleased to see our results were even just stable. And then to see they continue to improve over the next two years was just amazing. That's so to put cool. it another way, at the start of our study, over 80% of the children were classified as severe. Mm -hmm. At the two years later, uh, less than 20% were classified as severe, 40% were mild to moderate, and 40% didn't meet the criteria for autism. So they still had symptoms, but they didn't meet the full criteria for autism. So it was wow. pretty astonishing. That, Again, that something. really is. I mean, I don't really know of any other treatment that has that kind of uh, statistics with it. 
That's right. That's why we're so excited about it. And that's why the FDA uh, awarded us fast track status. And what oh. they think that means is that they recognize it's a promising treatment, not proven, but promising right. for an unmet need that we don't have any pharmaceutical treatment today that treats the core symptoms of autism, the language, the social, uh, the repetitive behaviors. And so this seems like a promising treatment that can affect all of those. And it certainly backs, you know, all of the interest right now and the research going on about how important the gut bacteria is to just our general health in, in, in overall health, our immune system and the whole gut brain access and all that just supports all of that in, in this study kind of supports that, that whole theory. That's right. And as we do more research, we're finding that many of the bacteria we can now identify with our DNA-based methods, uh, we don't even have names for yet. I mean, we, have, we know so little about what the gut bacteria is. What is the right amount? Is this a harmful or a, or a um, healthy bacteria to have? What's the optimal amount? We really do not know. So there's right. so much to learn. There's oh. so many questions there. I mean, even, you know, as we know, sometimes they, they work in symbiosis, like some that, that benefit when they're together and we see better effects when, when there's bacteria working together. And if one's missing, it might not have quite the same impact. And so there's so much to learn. And it's, it's such an amazing, it's an interesting field in general. Um, I think just studying the, the microbiome and, and all that, there's just so much to learn. I'm not sure uh, when we'll see uh, much progress on that because there's you know, trillions of bacteria, but this study in particular is so amazing. And what you found is just so, so remarkable. It's just, it's very exciting. Um, I'm so happy to hear that you're moving forward with next steps. Uh, so give us, give us a little bit of uh, maybe some insight on what you guys are doing next with it. And I know you got FDA fast track. So what does that mean for you? Yeah, well, the, F the fast track status means that the re FDA recognizes this is promising treatment for an unmet need. And so it means they give us more rapid response time, uh, more rapid help, but it also means um, that it's possible we might later, if our current studies are successful, we might be able to attempt breakthrough status. Mm -hmm. What that means is that normally with FDA, you have to do a phase one study first, like we did to demonstrate safety, and then a phase two study, and we're doing some of those now, uh, and that means a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trial. So half the people get the real treatment, half get the placebo. You see, does the real treatment group do better than the placebo? So we're doing those sorts of studies now. And then normally, you also have to do a phase three study afterwards. And that would be a, a study, a much larger study, like a phase two, but 10 to 20 sites around the country, 500 to 1,000 people cost you maybe half a billion dollars, oh my. right? So very expensive to do those sorts yeah. of studies. But um, if our current studies are very successful, we can try to apply for breakthrough status, meaning that at the end of phase two studies, the FDA might allow us to temporarily market it, but it would still require us to do phase three studies later. So it's very expensive uh, yeah. to get studies approved by the FDA, the, even a small our small 50 person study is going to cost about a million dollars. Wow. Um, but we're so blessed that we had over a thousand autism families around the country raise that million dollars for us within a couple months. Wow. Without them, we wouldn't be able to do the child study that we're just starting now. Oh but right now we're doing a study for adults with autism that's mostly funded by the federal government, but we have some uh, very important donations from families to supplement that. That's for 84 adults. We've already recruited 18 and treated them, and that's going well. We're seeing good benefits for adults, um, and we have another 60-some to go. Um, but the children's study we just announced a couple weeks ago, we received 1,400 applications. My staff is a little overwhelmed by yeah. emails and, and all that, but um, I bet. the best. Um, <laughs> and we have now selected uh, 50 people randomly we have another hundred on our wait list. And sadly, we had to tell everyone else, sorry, you didn't make the cut for this study. But again, we gave some suggestions and we hope that uh, we'll have um, more studies to come as time goes on. Oh, I imagine you will. That, that's the hope. Yeah. What, I, what might be useful too is to mention that from our first study, we learned um, a couple important things. 
One thing that we learned is that even though most children with autism were missing very different types of bacteria, there's one bacteria in particular that almost all the children with autism are missing, and that's called Prevotella. And that's a very special bacteria because it consumes fiber. So when you uh, consume high amount of fiber in your diet from eating lots of fruits and vegetables, uh, whole fruits, whole vegetables, then Prevotella converts that fiber into certain short chain fatty acids. And one of them called butyrate is a very important nutrient for the gut. It provides about 60 to 70% of the energy and nutrition for the cells that line the intestine. So people who don't consume enough fiber, and most people in the US don't consume enough fiber. True. Women consume only about half the recommended amount of fiber. Men consume only a third the recommended amount of fiber. And so literally the cells that line your colon are starving for this butyrate. Mm -hmm. And that's why we have so many GI problems in the country. The cells yeah. just aren't getting this key nutrient that they need. Right. So only a few bacteria like Prevotella can make uh, butyrate. And we found that children with autism are very low. Mm -hmm. There was a great study in Africa showing that people on very healthy diets, very high fiber diets, half of their gut bacteria is Prevotella. Whereas people in the US, less than 1% of their bacteria is Prevotella because we're so low at consuming fiber. And right. kids with autism, even lower. So you have the really healthy African diet, the not so great American diet, and then the kids with autism 10 times lower than the average American for Prevotella. That's quite a contrast. It's a big, big difference. And we found yeah. it again and again in the children with autism. And after treatment, levels went up 200 fold. Oh my goodness. So we really saw a big improvement in this bacteria. And we know that when Prevotella levels are high, then pathogens are low and vice versa. So we don't know which is the cause, which is the um, result, and it's chicken and egg. Is the Prevotella right. killing off the bad bacteria or the bad bacteria killing off the Prevotella? Or is it some of both? So we don't really know. So we here's a question, Dr. Adams. Before. When you conducted this study, did you have any dietary recommendations or uh, changes for the participants that were in the study? It's a great question. Because it's an FDA study and we're trying to prove the effect of just the treatment itself, we had to ask families not to make any changes in diet or any changes in medications or therapies during the study. And so bless their hearts, the families are very good about that. And so everything was the same. So even though the children were on these lousy diets in many yeah. cases, and some of the diets were really poor, like chicken nuggets and, and French fries. Yes, um, it's our beige, our beige diet that we like to call it. Yeah. Even though those, uh, many of the children were on poor diets, it didn't seem to matter that we were still able to restore a very healthy microbiota. In fact, I forgot to mention, at two, so before the study started, they were missing several hundred species of bacteria. Mm -hmm. At the end of treatment, it normalized. Two years later, they had more bacteria, more diversity than a typical child. So they had a oh. very, very healthy gut bacteria. Even uh, without making the dietary changes to increase fiber or anything else that would support that new microbiome? Right, right. that's wow. what's so amazing. That so is we, amazing. We thought it might just be temporary. Now, a few, child, a few of the families later did make some dietary changes after mm -hmm. the treatment study, but for the most part, no. Wow. Um, but the other thing that's really interesting is we learned five important clues about why these particular children developed these GI symptoms. Okay. So the five clues we learned, one is that you inherit most of your microbiome from your mother as part of a natural birth process. But we discovered that the mothers of the children with autism had a lower fiber consumption than typical moms. So typical moms are low and autism moms had on average even worse diets. So just not getting enough fiber. Yeah. So their gut bacteria probably weren't optimal to begin with. And then Roughly two thirds of the children in our study were born by C-section. When you're born by C-section, one problem is you don't aren't exposed to the vaginal bacteria and also some fecal matter as part of the birth process. Right. And then also um, the mother's giving an antibiotic with that C-section. When the mother's on antibiotics, it passes through the mother's breast milk into the child. So the child's getting those antibiotics 
the day they're born, the first few days they're born. And then we found, aside from that, they also had more use of oral antibiotics the first few years of life. So any gut bacteria that might have been transferred from mom are again attacked by the standard antibiotics, and that's harmful. And then we also found the children with autism nursed much shorter period. And so breast milk is really special for many reasons, but one of the important reasons is the fourth most important ingredient in breast milk is a special sugar that the infant can't consume and no bacteria can consume except one, one very special bacteria named after the infant called the infantus. And that one bacteria is able to consume this special sugar in mother's milk and then outcompete all other bacteria. So an infant who's nursing, almost all of the gut bacteria is temporarily the infantis. And then when the infant weans, then that naturally gives way to healthy bacteria. Um, But again, these children nursed a shorter period of time, didn't have that exposure um, to to that as much the infantis. And then finally, the children themselves were on a slightly less healthy diet, um, slightly lower fiber consumption. So again, it comes back to the importance of fiber, the importance of antibiotics, uh, the importance of that Prevotella that I mentioned. Well, now with, you know, all the, the, the studies and the talk we're hearing about the importance of bacteria, it seems, seems more like common sense now to us to try not to kill off the good bacteria and to make sure that we're, you know, feeding those good bacteria. So they colonize and take over, but, you know, we didn't know what we didn't know. And and so it wasn't really a, a, a priority and it wasn't really that thought of back then, you know, not even that long ago. So, you know, now we know what we know. And so now we need to build on that. We need to spread the word. And so the the work that you're doing, of course, and, you know, all of us out there are trying to spread the message so that people understand this because there's the, the scary part is there's so many people that, that don't know this. They don't know anything about that. There's, there's even clinicians and physicians that are out there that really aren't educated in the importance of this microbiome. Cause I mean, it can be overwhelmingly complicated, but um, I think, when you, you think about it from the perspective of simplicity, you know, just like your soil analogy, I believe that was amazing. You know, that that's a perfect analogy. Uh, I think that if we could start putting that um, emphasis and in, in the importance of these little buggers, because uh, they're they're just as important as some of our own cells in our body, right? That's right. That's right. I mean, we have as many cells of these bacteria in our gut as we do cells in our whole body. So they play so many important functions and. As I mentioned, regulating the immune system, helping our, our general metabolism, making neurotransmitters. And so we have still an incredible amount to learn from it. Yeah. Um, but it does seem that taking gut bacteria from very healthy, carefully screened donors seems to work very well. You know, it seems in general very safe. We had no adverse effects None? of getting the gut bacteria from the healthy donors. It was That's just that amazing. initial antibiotic caused some temporary worsening but the microbiota itself was very well tolerated. That is just so amazing. So cool. I, I love it. I love it. Um, so let me, let me, uh, we had a, a few people write in some questions ahead of time. So if you don't mind, uh, would you sure. mind answering a couple of those? Some of them we may have already answered, uh, you know, during your talk there, but uh, let's see what, well, one of the questions was, is this actually poop from another person that is transplanted? Um, That's what's used for um, treating C. diff infections. They'll just use raw stool and amazingly it works. We know even for animals, veterinarians have been doing this for much longer than uh, human doctors have. So if a colt has, um, uh, is born with uh, GI problems, we'll just take poop from mother, put it up junior's bottom and it cures um, these issues. So um, it can, we've known about it for animals for a long time. Uh-huh. It's only more recently we've been doing it for humans. But for our studies, we're actually working with the University of Minnesota and they purify it to remove all the waste material. So it's left with just the bacteria. So it's 99% bacteria. And in our current studies, we're using it in a pill form. So a special pill because normally if you take it orally, your stomach acid would destroy your, most of the probiotic. Right. But we have it encapsulated in a special way so it survives the stomach acid and it gets to the small intestine where it needs to go. And you did say that you gave an, uh, you know, a, an acid blocking medication as well, didn't you? 
in our first study, when we did not have the pill, we were just using a liquid formulation. Uh. We did use a stomach acid suppressant and that worked well, but we'd rather not have to use a stomach acid suppressant because you need that stomach acid for a reason. Um, and so we uh, prefer to just use these special pills instead. Okay, cool. Okay, um, another one is, uh, let's see, what distinguishes a healthy donor? Many things, so many things. So just like for the American Red Cross, we make sure that they don't have any infectious disease or risk of exposure to infectious disease, make sure that they're in good health, make sure that they have a normal body weight, not overweight or underweight, because those are associated with abnormal gut bacteria. Mm -hmm. We check that they don't have any GI problems and also that there's no history of GI cancer in their families. Um, we also check after donation to make sure that they're still healthy, that they weren't just coming down with some flu or cold or something. Um, and then finally, we check the stool itself to make sure that there's no presence of any C. difficile or any other a nasty bacteria that would cause a GI problem. Now, I imagine it, it might be difficult to find a donor. I mean, it's not like there's, you know, the way we have blood banks and sperm donor da donation. Like, how did you find these donors? Like, how does that work? We work with the University of Minnesota and they have their own donor pool there that mm -hmm. they uh, collect from. So um, they screen people very, very carefully. It's very expensive to screen or donor. It costs several thousand dollars oh, to do all of the screening that the FDA recommends um, because we wanna minimize the risk of infection. And that's why um, microbiota transplant has generally been so extremely safe for tens of thousands of people. Just the two sad cases I mentioned in people who are very immune compromised. So now we know also not to give it to people who are taking drugs to suppress their immune system. Um, so now we know not to do that. So this might be maybe too deep of a question, but how for, for one donation, how many treatments or how many people can be treated with that one sort of donation? Yeah, so it, it depends on the donation and we're still optimizing dosage, mm -hmm. um, but it could be five to 10 people could potentially be uh, treated. Again, it varies. We're kind of like the stage with when aspirin was first developed. How much aspirin do you need for a headache? Do you need a quarter of an aspirin? Do you need 10 aspirin? Mm -hmm. So we're still at learning. Our phase one study, we guessed the dosage. We guessed the duration of treatment, eight weeks, and it worked well. You, so you, you guessed pretty well, didn't you? <laughs> we guessed well, <laughs> but we may find even more works better. So in our new study, we're going to a longer treatment and a higher dosage to see if that will work even better. Cool, very good. Okay, so let's see, um, I, this is, uh, you've kind of um, answered this, but maybe we could kind of address it again. Are there any risks or adverse side effects to this type of treatment? Yeah, so the main issue is with the vancomycin that about two thirds of the children with autism, about half of the adults we've treated too, we've seen um, a temporary worsening of um, autism related symptoms, so hyperactivity, irritability. We've also seen worsening of anxiety or depression for a few days, and then generally it gets better. So usually symptoms just last, occur the first few days of antibiotic treatment and last for just the first few days. Okay. Um, I mean, that's pretty amazing, itself, I have to say. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but the microbiota itself, for our 18 children we first treated, or 18 adults, it's been very well tolerated. It's, you know, we're just restoring back what's normally missing. Right. So it's like with a blood, maybe an analogy be, would be like with a blood transfusion. If you get it from a healthy donor, the right match, you shouldn't expect any problems. Right. We're just right. restoring what was missing. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so let's see uh, the next question, which you kind of did also uh, address this. How many transplants are required or recommended for best results? And I know you're still kind of working through that, um, but if we're you want to answer that. Yeah. So we're still working on that. Our first study, we used eight weeks of treatment and we found it took about five weeks to reach, um, to achieve most of the GI benefits. And it took about 10 weeks before the autism symptoms initially seemed to peak. And then again, two years later, even more benefit. Um, and we're seeing that in our adult study too, that after treatment has stopped, we then, it takes time. It even takes a little more time for the adults, uh, presumably because it, they've had these GI problems longer, yeah. but we do longer term see more benefit. 
And I imagine if, if someone were to improve their dietary intake after the transplant, that that would maybe colonize and improve more. Absolutely. We think that's very likely to help as well. But again, within the study itself, the FDA doesn't allow us to have people change their diets, right. um, but we certainly recommend it after treatment. Cool. Okay. So uh, last question, someone put in, a, a, can't we get the same benefits from taking a probiotic orally or even rectally? And you did, you did mention that earlier that, I mean, we wouldn't be able to get near the amount of diversity or uh, specific strains uh, that, but I'll let you go ahead and answer um, in your way, how you would answer that. Yeah. So, so as we mentioned earlier, that most probiotics contain a single strain or maybe up to 10 to 20 strains. Yeah. Um, they, but the FDA has very clearly regulated that a certain number of antibiotics, a certain number of probiotics, primarily those that are cultured in milk, are allowed. They're grandfathered in. But any new probiotic, they're going to treat like a drug. And it's going to cost a hundred million to a billion dollars to get any new probiotic approved by the FDA. They're very cautious, understand the reasoning. Sure. Um, so it means that we can't introduce many of the um, pro many of the bacteria that are normally found in the human gut, except through microbiota transplant. So probiotics in principle, a good idea. In some cases, they provide some help, but usually when you stop taking them, usually the benefits are lost within a week or two. With our treatment, it seems that you're able to um, have long-term benefits lasting at least a couple of years, probably much longer than that. So exciting. It's just amazing. So now, uh, Dr. Adams, how would, if someone is hearing this and they're like, I am in, sold, let's do this. Like how, how is it, how far out is it before we're going to see this as a treatment planner? Is there any way for uh, people to sign up for your waiting list or are there any other uh, studies out there happening like this or trials going on, clinical trials? So currently our study is the only one going on in the U.S. Um, and uh, hopefully there'll be more in future. Our, we, have, uh, we had 500 people sign up for adult study. So we've closed that. People can still sign up to be in our information list to get more information in future. But for a child study, we received 1,400 applications. So we've We've now stopped collecting any new ones, but people can sign up for more information to learn about future studies. And we hope we'll have more studies in future as time goes on. Okay, why don't you give us that information? Where, where can they find that information? Oh, yeah, so my, my website is just um, autism.asu for Arizona State University, .edu, short for education. So just autism.asu edu. Great. And if uh, they want to find out more information about you and your other work, where can they find that? Um, we have a lot of general recommendations for families on my personal webpage. And so it's um, adamsautismresearch.com. Uh, so adamsautismresearch.com. In there, we have a um, summary of um, dietary, nutritional, and medical treatments for autism, about 18 different uh, recommendations, including a healthy diet and um, certain treatments for gut problems. So that information is there on our website. And then um, if you'd like, I can also talk about a vitamin mineral supplement briefly. Sure. Yeah. So we've also done a lot of research on vitamins and minerals. We found those to be very effective for treatment and even as part of a um, comprehensive nutritional protocol. Mm -hmm. And so we've now um, created a, um, a vitamin mineral supplement that's based on our research. It's available from a nonprofit we've created, um, Autism N for Nutrition, R for Research, C for Center.org. And so we also have a nutrition uh, protocol there. So we recommend starting out with the vitamin mineral supplement, then adding in fish oil, then adding in carnitine, then adding in a healthy allergen-free diet. And that combination treatment uh, we found to be very effective in, in both reducing GI problems somewhat, uh, seven point gain in IQ, a big jump in developmental age. So a lot of good benefits overall. 
Amazing study. So uh, Dr. Adams is going to be joining us again on uh, January 7th, Tuesday, January 7th. And this is, he'll go into great detail about his comprehensive nutrition, nutritional and dietary intervention for autism. And we'll go over the results of his 12 month clinical trial. So we'll get into great detail about all of that um, at, at our next uh, session with Dr. Adams, because he was so kind and generous to come back to us again. Uh, so we'll look forward to that in January, January 7th. And I'll post about that and uh, email out and give everybody links so that they'll be well aware of that talk as well. Um, is there anything else that you would like to add uh, to this talk? I, I think we've covered the main points. Again, I just want to say how grateful we are to all the families who have participated in our study and all the 2,000 plus families who have made donations to support our research. Uh, without them, we couldn't be doing the research studies that we are now for children and adults. And I'm sure that they thank you right back for all of your hard work. And as I said, when I was uh, reading the laundry list of things that you are in charge of, involved in, and all that, we all really appreciate all the work that you do um, and respect all of the work as well. Um, thank you so much for taking the time to be here with us. And we look forward to seeing you again January 7th. Sounds good. Thanks okay. very much. Thank you, Dr. Adams.